Soul Question. Who invented YouTube in the first place? It might be hard to imagine, but there was a time when the internet wasn't all comment sections, collabs, makeup tutorials, and Minecraft. That's right, we're talking about the dreaded dark ages before YouTube was invented way back in 2005. That year, three dudes named Chad Hurley, Steve Chen, and Jawed Kareem had the idea for a website where people around the world could watch and share original videos. It was a big idea, but it got off to a small start. Their headquarters was in a garage next to a pizza place in Menlo Park, California. They officially activated the domain name YouTube.com on Valentine's Day 2005, and it was love at first sight. The very first YouTube video was posted by co-founder Jawed Kareem on April 23rd, 2005, and he called it Me at the Zoo. And it was, well, a 20-second video of him at the zoo talking about elephants. It's not exactly the most exciting video to debut with, but it didn't seem to matter. Just a year after launching, YouTube was one of the fastest growing sites on the internet. By July of 2006, their videos were already pulling in more than 100 million views per day. Now that YouTube had really hit the big time, it started to form into the platform we know it as today. Customization let creators and companies alike make their own channels, and before long, the modern YouTuber scene was alive and well. Who gets credit for actually inventing the internet? As you probably know, the internet isn't one big company, building, or server somewhere powering everything online. It's a great series of interconnected systems and fail-safes that all work together to keep it humming along. So it might not be a surprise to learn that no one person invented the internet alone. In order to understand the early origins of the internet, you have to go back to well before computers were even invented. You see, there were some scientists who predicted that we would one day have a network of info that could be accessed instantly worldwide. A famous scientist by the name of Nikola Tesla proposed a world wireless system in the early 1900s that he claimed could transmit energy all across the globe. He even built a wireless station that was designed to send messages from the US to England and to ships at sea in between. But it wasn't until the late 1960s that the actual internet started to take shape. The very first prototype of the modern internet was actually created by the military. You see, a military government agency originally called the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, needed a way for all of their separate computers to communicate in one place, and the building blocks of the internet were invented. In the early 1990s, a scientist took the internet to the next level by creating something called the World Wide Web. This gave regular people like you and me a way to connect to the internet by inventing internet basics like web pages, hyperlinks, and internet browsers. This cosmetic change unlocked the internet to the public, who could now surf the web for the very first time, and we've never looked back since. Who actually invented cars in the first place? No one person invented the car, but there is one man who gets special credit for helping to transform transportation from horse-drawn carriages to full-on automobiles. Carl Benz, the German inventor of a three-wheeled motor car called the Motorwagen in 1886. Benz built three prototypes of his gas-powered carriage over the next two years before deciding it was time to drum up some interest in his new invention. Carl Benz's wife and business partner, Bertha, took one of the cars early in the morning and drove it 66 miles to her mother's house. The clunky car puttered along at about 10 miles per hour and was so new that Bertha had to improvise multiple repairs along the way. But the trip was a success. Bertha got to her destination and learned how to improve the design with the repairs she made. It also showcased the car to a skeptical public, who still saw cars as impractical at the time. 
So while Carl Benz is often credited with inventing the very first car, his was far from the first self-propelled vehicle. Over 500 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci drew sketches of a mechanized cart that could move on its own. In the more recent past, a French inventor named Nicolas Joseph Cugnot built a steam-powered car-like contraption around 1769. His invention could move about the same speed as a person walking and had to stop every 20 minutes. Over the next several decades, other inventors worked diligently on designs for an internal combustion engine that could be powered by gasoline. By 1895, Nine years after Carl Benz debuted his Motorwagen, a French inventor named Rudolf Diesel designed the diesel engine, the first fully functioning internal combustion engine to hit the market. Now that there was a standard engine, other companies developed and sold their own cars, and before long, a whole new industry was born. Over the years, cars have changed quite a bit. Affordable electric cars hit the market in the early 2000s, and self-driving cars appeared to be right around the corner. So, who invented cars? Well, no one person. The important part is that people keep reinventing them. Who actually invented smartphones in the first place? In order to understand how the iPhone came to be, we have to go back to the very beginning of the mobile phone. And it turns out, mobile phones are older than you might think. The very first successful mobile telephone calls were offered to the first class customers aboard a German train that ran between Berlin and Hamburg all the way back in 1926. By the mid 50s, the first mobile phones were released for personal vehicles in Sweden. Only a little over a hundred people signed up for the bulky tech, so it's safe to say it wasn't a hit. Over the next few decades, telephone companies continued to develop the technology to make mobile phones smaller, more reliable, and eventually handheld. In the early 70s, an engineer at Motorola made the first public call from a mobile phone. It looked bulky by today's standards, but at the time, it was considered quite a feat to make a mobile phone so small. A decade later, Motorola released the Motorola Dynatac 8000X. This phone was nicknamed the Brick because it was about the size and weight of a concrete brick. It cost almost four grand could only handle about half an hour of talk time and took about 10 hours to charge. A decade later, IBM released the Simon Personal Communicator. It's considered the first smartphone ever sold. It had a touchscreen and a few basic apps, like a clock, calculator, notepad, and address book. But it was also fairly big at a time when mobile phones were getting smaller and smaller, so it was quickly pulled off the shelves after poor sales. Then, finally, in 2007, the iPhone was released by Apple, and the smartphone took about five giant steps forward all at once. It hit the shelves in the U.S. on June 29, 2007, with thousands of people around the country lining up and even camping outside stores to get their hands on one. In the years since, other companies have released their own smartphones, and new models have all kinds of high-tech features. The only question remaining is, what's coming next? We all know that the keyboard isn't actually in alphabetical order, but why? The classic keyboard we all use every day actually has a name. It's called the QWERTY keyboard layout. You can probably guess where the name comes from. Q, W, E, R, T, and Y are the first six letters on this layout, starting from the top left. It seems like a totally random way to arrange the letters, but it turns out it wasn't an accident. In order to understand why we went with QWERTY, we have to go all the way back to Milwaukee in 1874. That was the year the first commercial typewriter was released, designed by a guy named Christopher Scholes. That typewriter included an early version of the same QWERTY keyboard layout we still use now. So why did Scholes choose QWERTY? Well, it was all about how the typewriters were being used. You see, some of the very first people to test out typewriters back in the 1870s were telegraph operators who needed to quickly transcribe messages from Morse code. 
The telegrafters found an alphabetical layout was confusing and slowed them down when translating code. They gave Scholz feedback, and over several years, he made modifications to the layout until finally landing on the QWERTY keyboard we've been using ever since. The QWERTY layout has only ever had one challenger since. It's called the Dvorak Simplified Keyboard, and it was invented by a doctor in the 1930s. Dr. Dvorak rearranged the keyboard to try and put the most commonly used keys in spots where your fingers naturally sit when typing. It sounds like a good idea, but people were already used to using the QWERTY keyboard, and Dvorak's design never quite caught on. So, does it make sense that the keyboard we text with is based on the needs of telegraph operators? Well, no, but could you imagine trying to switch to a new layout? No, thank you. Who invented the TV in the first place? The history of the TV goes back a bit further than you might think to a time when the radio was the newest and most advanced form of mass entertainment. Around the 1920s, engineers and inventors started looking for ways to send pictures over the radio. In 1922, a guy named Charles Jenkins became the first known person to send a still image through radio waves. In 1926, another inventor named John Baird took the tech even further, sending the first live transmission over a device he called the televisor. But the lion's share of the credit for inventing the TV as we know it usually goes to a man named Philo Farnsworth, who filed the first patent for a fully electronic television. Being all electric, it was the first TV design without mechanical parts which allowed it to transmit way more data than earlier inventions like the televisor. Farnsworth called his state-of-the-art device the image dissector, and quickly other inventors began improving on the design. Before long, the television became the hottest new technology, and sales started to skyrocket. By the beginning of the 1970s, when color TVs were first popularized, a majority of families in the U.S. owned one. By the late 1990s, more than a billion TVs were in use around the world. Having TVs in so many households allowed people almost instant access to information and entertainment from just about anywhere. Nowadays, TVs are used for even more than watching the news and your favorite shows. Internet, streaming, video games, and on-demand movies have totally transformed how we watch television over the past few decades. No one can say how the TV will continue to transform into the future, but one thing does seem almost certain. TV will keep changing in all sorts of weird, unexpected ways. Who? actually invented computers. The computer might be a thoroughly modern device, but it turns out it's an older invention than you'd think. The computer as we know it isn't quite that old, but it did first start to take shape in the late 1700s. Until that time, humans always had to do all the work of a computer. Anything from figuring out taxes to building a bridge takes lots of precise math. So people would spend all day solving complicated equations by hand, then writing them down in books for other people to use. As you might imagine, this took tons of time and effort to do. Enter English inventor Charles Babbage. Babbage wanted to build a machine that could make calculations faster than a person, using a smaller workforce and making fewer mistakes. So, around 1819, Babbage began building his very first prototype called a difference engine. It was big, clunky, and needed to be cranked by hand, but three years later, he finished it and announced it to the media. The invention caught the eye of the British government, who gave Babbage 1,700 pounds to keep working on his prototype. And work he did! But improving on his designs proved to be costly and time-consuming. Babbage worked for a full 19 years without ever managing to build one that fully worked. But he kept tinkering and tinkering and tinkering. His budget ballooned to 10 times the size of the original 1,700 pounds he was given. And just as his invention was starting to work, the government abandoned the project for good. But that didn't stop Babbage. He designed a newer, more complex computer called an analytical engine 
that had several key features of a computer today. A central processing unit, or CPU, memory, and even a printer. But without funding, sadly, his state-of-the-art design was never built. Instead, he wrote over 5,000 pages of detailed notes on exactly how it would work. Babbage's notes were so detailed that a team of engineers built his exact design in 1991. It's seven feet tall, 11 feet long, and it's two times as heavy as a full-grown elephant. Today, we can fit several million times as much computing power into those little devices in our pockets than Babbage's machine could ever handle. And to think, we mostly use all that amazing computer power to <laughs> order pizzas and post pictures. <laughs>